Hi everyone. I'm just logging on a little bit early to make sure there are no glitches and that the lighting's okay and that everyone can hear me. Um, this will be Yoga for Potters, Body Mechanics and Beyond with me, Dawn Boudreau. If you can hear me and see me, please drop me a note and let me know. Um, I need to just make sure that I'm set up here properly. Thanks for showing up. If you can see me, please make a message on the, make a note on there. Let's see. Okay. All right. I'm seeing myself and can you hear me out there? Okay, I see a few of you have logged in. Just drop me a note and say hi if you would. It's almost six. We still have a couple of minutes until we get started. All right, let's see. I do see a comment. Hi from Boston. Hi, Jane. All right, very good. So you can hear me okay and see me okay? All right, I think I'm getting it here. All right, we're just waiting um, to get started at six. We have another minute left. I'm trying to make sure that I can see everybody's replies. All right, hi everybody. So behind me, you'll see while we're waiting, there's something for you to look at. Um, this is a built-in bookcase and um, it's got some, some of my pieces and some from friends of mine. This is a lovely avocado plant. I did a little live, um, I was practicing and so I did a little live on how to do avocados, so um, okay. So we are right around six o'clock and I see a few people coming in. Um, haven't had anybody tell me if they can hear me yet, so um, I'm assuming you can. And we are going to get started. And so my name is Dawn Boudreau and I am really excited to be here today and chat with you all about body mechanics for um, potters also yoga for potters. And so why I did this, um, I created this because I trained professionally as a massage therapist and as a yoga teacher. And I also am a pottery enthusiast. And so when I, after training, when I went back in to the pottery studio, um, I could, I was looking with different eyes, you know, I was, um, I had more of an awareness of the body, the structure, the alignment, body mechanics. Um, I noticed a difference in how I moved in the studio and I also noticed how my classmates were moving as well. And I, when I started looking at it, I was noticing that um, there were areas that we could improve. I could improve for myself. Um, if there was any pain that was starting in my hands or my hips or my shoulders or my neck or my arms, there were things that I had in my toolbox from my professional training in the other fields to be able to pull those out and to work on myself and to create um, a different experience. And it allowed me to um, share that with others as well. So my classmates at, um, I'm in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, and at National Park Community College, um, my clay brick were called mud buds over there instead of clay buddies were the mud buds. And, um, so they've been wonderful and so supportive and helpful with me getting this off the ground. So, um, okay. I see some responses. Let me make sure I'm able to see the comments. Okay. So I got Jane from Boston, Sam. Hi, Stephanie from Ohio. Hey, Tim. Um, Vicki, loud and clear. Okay, Shannon from Alaska. All right, so we're all across the board here. Okay, well, good. I'm glad. Thank you. This is, uh, this is new for me. So if there's anything, just write me a note if I need to shift anything. So, um, so yeah, so I wound up 
um, talking to my classmates about it and they were interested in, in just little slight changes that could make a big difference. And so that's what I want to share with you today um, is why I did it, why I came up with the idea of yoga for potters and why body mechanics are so important. So I have my cheat sheet. I was going to do a shared screen for you all, but that was a little beyond my tech savvy skills at the moment. So, um, okay. So why is there a link between yoga, pottery, and massage therapy, other than what I just said. So that's my personal experience with it. But we do have, hey, Orange County, California. Um, so they're all expressive arts and they're using the body and the hands in the ability to bring those creative gifts into the world. And so it's also very heavy body movement using the hands and this is some of the smallest bone structure in our body or our hands and it's very labor intensive whether you're a production potter or a hobbyist whether you wedge clay all day or you have a pug mill um, those different things can still be repetitive and that strain can catch up with you and um and so it's easy to to do a lot of different repetitive motion without even realizing it from the way that we sit, the way that we stand, the way that we walk, the way that we cut vegetables, the way that we drive, um, did I say sleep, um, work. We might be doing a little more sleeping these days um, with the situation. So being very aware of how we are using our bodies and um, being very mindful. So bringing a lot more mindfulness into those movements is important. Um, also, being sure to, well, first let me ask you this. Does anyone warm up before they start their work with clay for the day? Or do you just dive right in and start throwing? Do you do any warm ups? Do you do any exercises, any stretches, anything like that? Let's see if anybody has a response for that. Anybody, anybody? Okay, so while I'm waiting for you to answer if you do any warm-ups or not, um, Tim, would you say, well, like dot, 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 well, maybe? Um, okay, so proper body mechanics are necessary for longevity. And that is one of my focuses with helping other artists is when I was a massage therapist, I saw so many people who had injuries and surgeries and they lived in constant pain. And I saw a lot of my classmates and I lived in a variety of states where I took a couple of pottery classes and everywhere, everyone, every age was having some issues. And so hopefully this will bring a little bit more awareness to your movements and then let me know, you know, over a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, if you do notice a difference by bringing more awareness to your movements. Okay, Shannon, so you don't warm up. Um, oh, are you guys stuck on the screen? I see myself partially stuck. Hopefully the connection is okay. It looks, I've got full bars here. Okay, well, hopefully it'll get unstuck. So we'll just keep going. So um, so what's your typical pottery posture? So I kind of would like you to stalk yourself, to, to really bring awareness to everything that you do. You know, when you're working on a vase, are you, are you're at the wheel, are you hunched over, really digging down, getting, I should probably stand, I'm short. So. This is a new thing here with this adjustment. Um, but are you? How are you standing? How are you sitting? Are you? Do you stand to throw? Do you sit? Do you do the uh, taco bend where your body is folded over like that? Um, all these things make a difference. Hi from Ontario, Western Australia. All right, we're really covering a lot of territory today. Thanks for joining us. Um, so thinking about what your what your typical posture is when you are throwing, hand building, wedging, um, carrying clay, loading the kiln, all these different things are important to dissect and really pay attention to. Um, even, like I was saying, everyday activities that we do beyond the studio, um, 
those all can add up and have a cumulative effect on our body. So being kind to our bread and butter, um, making sure that we are giving them the love that they need, our hands are our best tools as potters, and it's really important to, to pay attention and to do what we can to make it a little bit easier for our body to function in its proper way. Um, so there, you know, the body is basically, it can be a well-oiled machine. And when I was a massage therapist, I would ask my clients, I would say, well, so if you have a car, what do you do with your car when you get an oil change? Do you put orange juice in there? Do you put water? Do you put Coca-Cola? You know, what is your approach to changing your oil? And they would look at me like I was crazy and they would say, well, of course I would put oil in the car in the proper place. And I said, okay, well, exactly. And your car can't function well without those components in order. So um, same thing with our bodies fueling our bodies properly, moving our bodies properly, and caring for them. So, let's see if there are any questions. Hi, Tammy, how are you? <laughs> All right, so thinking about your, prop your typical posture, and then as we go through this discussion, see over time if you're sitting a little different, if you're moving a little different, and we're also going to do some um, modified yoga poses as well, so that they're very arm and hand and wrist friendly so that you don't have to give up a yoga practice. Um, it, you don't have to pick clay or yoga. You can do both and you can bring them together as well. So it's very helpful. Even if you're not a typical yoga person, these are basically movements and stretches that open the body and, um, and give you a little more flexibility, which will ideally help you have longevity as a maker as well. Hey, Cindy, how are you? Okay, so basics of body mechanics and um, like I said, increased mobility and longevity, which is also flexibility. So there's a saying that you are only as young as your spine is old. No, you're only as old as your spine is young. So, sorry, uh, we can edit that part. Um, but having the flexibility and that movement and that openness and that flow of your spine instead of having um, tightness and soreness, that can make a really big difference. And it can improve our art if we are not worried about pain and we're not impinged when we are um, finding fluidity in our creativity, I think it can possibly make a big difference for you. So um, we're going to define body mechanics and planes of movement are very important. And I'm not talking jet planes because none of us are going anywhere right now. Um, and we're also going to discuss larger muscle groups and repetitive strain injury, which I know is a very big concern for a lot of us um, using our hands and, and using and losing use of our hands. That's a very big concern as well. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? I know I'm, we're only 10 minutes in, I've covered a bit of territory, but if you have any questions or anything in specific that you would like me to cover, let me know. Um, so body mechanics, the uh, traditional definition of it is the application of physical principles to achieve maximum efficiency and to limit risk of physical stress or injury to the practitioner. So that is alignment of the body, which is posture. That is balance between both sides. Are we leaning to one side or forward or back? And also coordinated movements when we're wedging, throwing, doing things like that. Hi from the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Tamara, I have a friend that lives in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Maybe you guys know each other. Um, hey, Kevin, how are you? I know that guy, he's in my, um, if it's who I think it is, he's in the group with me in National Park. Um, okay, so when the body is well aligned, whether standing, sitting, or lying down, the strain on the joints, muscles, tendons, and ligaments is minimized. And that is our goal, is to minimize any strain to the body. So um, three anatomical planes of movement. I don't know if this is backwards for you or not, so the writing may be backwards, but at least you can, you can see what I'm talking about. So when we talk about the planes, see this blue, 
Um, it's like a, if you imagine like a, a sheet of glass through the body. So the sagittal suture we have on our heads here, the midline. So the sagittal is cutting through the body and it separates the body from left to right. And that movement is forward movement. We want to keep, imagine keep that uh, plane of glass straight. So you want to, when you move, so forward folds, um, walking, wedging, moving forward like that, those fall under this plane of movement. And then over here on this side, we have the frontal, we're not gonna say coronal, uh, <laughs> that was unintentional for this time frame, but so the frontal one. So this one cuts the body from front to back. So it's coming through as if we had it through this area. And so the movement of left to right is part of that plane of movement. And then the third one is the transverse or horizontal. And so this one cuts the body on a horizontal. So it's shown at the waist, but it can also be here at the neck. And so if we keep this straight, this plane of glass straight, then we're turning, we're twisting. So that's turning the head. It's also twisting the spine and the body, moving the shoulders. Anything that twists along that plane of movement. So that's what I'm referring to when I talk about the anatomical planes of movement. Let's see if there's any questions. Hi from Alexandria, Virginia. Hi, Jen. Um, all right, tomorrow we'll talk later <laughs> about who my friend is in New Hampshire. Um, she's not a clay person though. Um, okay, so any other questions right now about the planes of movement? Does that make sense why that is important? Um, and of course, those planes can be uh, combined. And with our movements, we're not just walking forward, we're walking, we're turning our heads, we're at the wheel, we're bending over, we're turning to look at our pots, anything like that is incorporating this um, planes, of, planes of movement. So, um, let's see if there's any questions right now. Okay, uh, the anatomy of a clay athlete. I say that as potters, we are athletes. And the reason I say that is because we are doing, okay, here's the definition of an athlete. It's a person who is proficient in sports and other forms of physical exercise. Clay is very physically, um, it's intense. It can be very intense. It can be very gentle, but it can also at times be very intense. Those bags of clay or boxes of clay are very heavy. The wedging can really take a toll on our bodies, right? Um, so there's a lot of physical exertion for extended periods of time. Most people that I've talked to, they don't warm up they jump into their studio and they just, hours, especially right now, right? We have a lot more time on our hands. And so a lot of people are in the studio, which is absolutely wonderful. And I would like to invite you to look at, um, look at your, uh, how you're doing things in your studio. What is your efficiency, but also what is your body efficiency, not just your throwing time clay efficiency there. Um, very physically demanding, right, Jen? There's how many, two exclamation points on that. So it does. And if we want to do this for a very long time, um, we, we need to give our bodies a little bit of extra love. So um, one of the things when I was in massage school, so I'm five one, and um, you know, I was working on clients from little kids all the way to, I had a, a hockey, uh, a hockey player as a client once. And I mean, he was, he was as tall as the doorway and we were both like, how is this gonna work? But what, what I did was instead of just using my hands to work, I used the body mechanics that I'm going to share today and it uses the larger muscle groups and bones in the body rather than the little ones. It comes from the hips, it comes from the legs, it comes from the bigger areas so that you are not stressing your favorite tool, your hands and your wrist, more than you need to. Um, so building yourself up, and one way to do that, to build strength, to open the body, 
to build muscle is also to do some yoga. So we'll get into those in a little bit. Okay, any other questions or comments right now? So um, another thing I have a question about is, does anyone take breaks? I know a lot of people, when they get in the studio, they just put their nose to the wheel and they just get going and they don't stop for hours on end. And I invite you to look at adding and building in some breaks and I'll teach you um, a couple of things that are really easy to do. You don't even have to get off your chair if you don't want to. We'll do some chair yoga. Um, I'll teach you some things against the wall. If your balance is a little iffy or you don't want to risk falling, then I have ideas and suggestions for things that are easy for anyone to do. If you can stand next to a wall and lean against a wall, then it can help you with your poses. And then over time, if you feel that your balance is better and stronger, you can move off the wall if you want to. Um, but this is something that, that's why I say it's for everyone. You don't need to have experience with yoga. You don't need to have a yoga mat. You don't need to, um, I'm not even wearing yoga clothes right now. I'm wearing jeans because these are, um, well, they're stretchy jeans, so there's a little bit of movement more than regular jeans, but still, it will, um, I think you'll see in just a little bit, we'll get to that. All right, let me see for some. Tim, you've got to wash your hands to eat candy. I wonder if you could figure out, I'm using your handy dandy trick about um, putting the box with clay and then having the tube and putting the phone on that. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, maybe you could figure out a way to just like, have some candy coming at you that way. Um, okay, Lisa, you take breaks, great. Um, Alexis, I take breaks to eat and stretch and clean my materials, okay, very good. So you've got the stretching in there. Um, maybe you'll enjoy some of these additional poses I'm gonna talk about here. Um, Tammy, no, but my shoulder is killing me after sculpting for a week. Okay, so maybe we can get a little bit of relief with some of the things we're talking about here. And Jen, benefits of a community studio. Nothing is ever right at hand, so you end up taking breaks. Yeah, I do too. When I'm at the studio, I wind up walking and talking, and I wind up on the other side quite a bit. So um, so that's good and also uh, a little distracting, right? Um, like a hamster water bottle with M&Ms. Yeah, I was picturing M&Ms or Skittles or, you know, whatever, whatever you need for that day, Tim. That works. <laughs> um Brooke, I've torn my extensor tendon doing pottery. The recovery has been six months and I can't even use it still. Be careful, peeps. Very, very true. And so disclaimer, you know, you know your body best than anyone. And if you start to feel a little bit of something that isn't right, rather than pushing through it, I invite you to explore what's going on and, and start paying attention a little bit more. Maybe put a mirror across from your wheel so that you can watch yourself um, or catch yourself in different places that you wouldn't normally notice your, your movements. Okay, um, so let's do a little activity here. So I called it leveraging large muscles for longevity. I went with the L's there. So, okay, small movements can make a really big so what I would like you to do is take your hand, I'm gonna stand up here, take your hand and cup it over, whichever hand, it doesn't matter, cup it over your opposite shoulder. So I'm really getting into this meaty pec area in front of the collarbone and the shoulder. And so I just want to be able to, when I move my arm, I want to be able to feel it. If you need to, if that's not comfortable, you can just do fingertips that will also work quite well. So um, take the, I'm using my left hand and I'm going over onto my shoulder area here on my right. And then I want you to just do a little bit of movement. This may seem silly at first, but just go with it. Um, so just do a little bit of movement of your index finger. Can you feel, I want you to see if you can feel any movement up here in the shoulder area, okay? So you're just doing a little movement and then add another finger. Now I can start to feel it when I have two fingers. So if I have, and I'm only moving, I'm only moving my fingers like, pretend like you're rolling like a little 
a little ball of clay, like a little bead, or you know, you're starting to to um, cut or carve something, just a little bit of movement there. Okay, so then now move your whole hand like you're rolling a bigger ball. Are you feeling up in this area? Are you feeling any kind of movement? I can really feel it right here where those muscles are connecting. Okay, now really start, let me move my chair. Really start to move the whole arm. Okay, so now I'm, I'm pretending that I'm wedging, right? Well, this is a little over dramatic. Uh, a little more drama, right? But I'm, I'm wedging, I'm moving. Do you feel all of that in here, how that's moving, right? Okay, so Jen didn't feel it till she moved her whole hand. So, um, and being a massage therapist for 20 something years, my touch is a little bit more sensitive than most people. A lot of people didn't feel it till they went to the wedging type of situation here. So pretend, and you're just moving your arm, right? You're only moving your arm and your hand, not the rest of your body at this point. So you feel it a lot in this area. Now, what I invite you to do, let me see. This is where it's gonna get a little tricky. I'm gonna back this up so that hopefully you can see more movement. Can you see? Okay, so if I am wedging just with my arms, and that's what a lot of people do, they'll stand and they'll wedge and they'll move, right? But I invite you to do what we call the Tai Chi stance. So in Tai Chi, you, you're standing and you have um, your hip width apart, and then you want to take one foot forward and then I take one back. So then I've got this little, I can do this little dance, right? I have this little play. Now, when I do that and I hold my wrist straight, then, um, and I lean into it, I'm not moving my arms, I'm letting my leg, my larger muscles, the hips, the legs, the thighs, that is giving me the movement. And see, I can still do my wedging if I lean into it like that. Does that make sense? All right, any questions on that? So that's what I find really can make a difference with wedging. In that way, you're not overdoing these muscles. It's like a swimmer, when they utilize these muscles over and over and over, it'll start to wear it out. And just like Jen and other people, you know, we can really injure our shoulder areas and um, the, and I'm going to show you a photo of um, of why there's so much intricate nature going on in here with muscles and bones and tendons and ligaments. Um, exactly. So there's so much more power with your whole body. The Tai Chi wedging stance makes it so much easier to wedge larger pieces of clay. That's what Cami says. Yes, I even small pieces too. So, um, so a few of you, it sounds like you've used it, or just now you did it with me, and um, I. And making sure that your stance, you know, you don't want to be your feet right next to each other because then you're wobbly and you're not even. But if you stand where you have um, hip width apart and then bring one leg forward and then just play with it. And it also will depend on the height of your table. Um, my setup is a little different than I intended it. So I don't have, um, we're just going to pretend. Okay, so let's see if this is good. That's not gonna work, that's as high as it goes. Let's pretend that I have a table. So um, with me being on the shorter side at school, we have a high wedging table. And so my hands are about up here. So when I'm wedging, even if I get in my stance, like it's kind of in my face, it's a little hard. So it's challenging for me and it's, it's pushing my body up to do the movement that I need to do. Ideally, if I had a studio at home, then I would be able to make my table height what I need it to be. And um, going back to a massage therapy reference, you can, at a workshop, you could always tell whose table was mine because mine was the shortest one. But what you do is you want your table, so when you're standing there, you want to move your, um, your wrist flex your wrist here and where this levels off, where your hands are flat, then that's ideal for your tabletop. So if this is where mine is, that's very different than at school where it's a lot higher. 
So if I get into my stance and I come down to it, then I've got that movement. Then I can really um, get into it more without stressing my upper body as much. Let's check the comments on that. Anybody have any questions on that Tai Chi stance? Do you need to see it again? I'm just gonna grab a quick sip of water right here. Okay, so um, that movement activity that we did there, you can feel it in all different parts of your body, but I just wanted to point out the shoulder area, and here's why. A lot of people are familiar with um, repetitive strain injuries like carpal tunnel or, um, or other things like that. This one is one that I saw a lot in my massage practice. It's called thoracic outlet syndrome. And again, this might be reversed for you and I apologize for that, but I just want to show you, um, since I didn't do the screen share, this is, um, this is what we were looking at. So this area here, we've got our muscles in red we've got our clavicle which is our collarbone so that's this bone here um, then we've got our pec muscles coming in we also have tendons and ligaments and then we have arteries and veins and nerves and so there's this little bitty area that is up here where all of these things combine and if we are out of alignment and we are overtaxing this area and these pec muscles are tightened and pulling our shoulders forward, what happens to this area? That hole gets smaller and smaller and then it pinches on those nerves and then that's where we can get the pain, the num numbness, the tingling sensations in the arms and fingers. Has anybody ever had, I hate to ask that, but I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience. I know that I did personally as well. And it took a lot of work. At first, people would think, oh, my back hurts, my neck is sore to massage my back. And that's actually one of the worst things you can do for your pec muscles because the opposite muscles are on the back. So if you are opening and releasing the back, which feels really good, but when those muscles are relaxed, they lengthen more. And so what happens when those back muscles are lengthened, then these are still tight and this just pulls tighter and tighter and tighter. So we're hunched, we're already hunched, we're driving hunched, we're doing computer work. We, you know, we're doing a lot of different things that um, have our bodies in reading, you know, cooking, um, our bodies are in this position way too much as it is. So opening the body, what we want to do is we want to release these pec muscles. And one of the um, good things right now is that considering uh, we need good lung health as well, a lot of pressure points are in this area too. I'm not gonna get into that, but just FYI, you might wanna look into that. So if we can self-massage and open up this, these pec muscles and rolling our shoulders back, just do that yourself. Just feel like, what's your normal stance? Mine is forward. I'm not perfect with this by any means, you know, teach what you need to learn, right? And so my body is a little more forward. So when I bring consciousness to it and I roll it back, look at that difference, right? So here it is like this. And then when I roll my shoulder back, look at that length difference that there is. So working this, bringing the shoulders back and proper alignment. And we're going to get into that a little bit more with the yoga poses. So um, anybody have any questions? Let's see. All right, so Heather liked the wedging table height. You're welcome for that. Um, like it is very important. Okay. Okay, I still see you and I'm still alive. Okay, um, sorry about that. So um, yes, and the wedging table, you know, think about if you're building your own wedging table at home or even at a studio, if you need it to be mobile and you put those um, casters on, that's going to add a few inches of height for you. Also, what shoes do you normally wear? My massage table height was different if I was wearing shoes or if I wasn't wearing shoes. So I needed to pay attention to that because sometimes it would give an inch and that can make a big difference when you're doing the same repetitive thing. I used to give 
six, seven, eight massages a day sometimes. It just depends. So very good um, to be aware of your table heights. And if you're a hand builder, watch same thing. You know, what is your table height there? And the wheel, that's another very important thing. When we're sitting at the wheel, not only do we want our posture to be good, we don't want to be over in that taco bend, but um, I, oh, do I have a picture? Let me see. I said I, I didn't, um, I don't think I printed it out. Uh, I, I went around to my classmates and I caught them, um, you know, just really into their work and just focused. And, and some of them were bent over and one of them was up, she was at the wheel and she was up on her tiptoes. And so I said, ah, oh, you're on your tiptoes, put, the, put your feet down. And when she put her feet down, what happened was, let's see if you can, if you can see me here. Um, so she was up on her tiptoes and when she went tiptoe it made her feet or her her legs a little more of a 90 degree angle and when i called her out she put her feet down and then it gave an angle that was larger right so she the solution was to we have bricks um concrete bricks in the studio so taking a brick i have a yoga brick right now but if i put that yoga brick on the floor, do you see how it makes a difference? Now, I, as far as chairs go, I like this is a um, swivel chair, and it's very cushy, and it's also adjustable. So I like that depending on what I'm doing and where I'm sitting, so I can adjust to get my proper bend. You would really ideally like a 90 degree bend here. And I can feel that it takes the strain off of this area in the body. All right, should your table height be as low as your wedging table? Um, so, oh, you're saying, I would sit with, um, I would sit with it and see. I think a lot of that, um, Tamara, is going to have to do with your uh, ability to change the height of your chair as well. Um, so if I'm at a table, I don't need it to be, you know, up here, I need it to be down, but where it's comfortable for me. So where I'm not lifting my shoulders up and I'm not having to stretch too far, but where I can sit comfortably and have it at a nice level. So um, probably chest height, but we all have different sizes of torsos. Um, they're across the board similar, but you might want to just play with that and see. That's why I like, see I can, I can go, I can go down if I need to, or I can come back up. So that's really nice and simple. Um, it's also a little more cushy on the, on the sits bones since we're sitting on those quite a bit. Um, okay, Tamara is usually standing. So again, I would play with that and see. Um, I have not built my own studio yet, so I kind of just have to go with um, what we have at school. But um, I, I've, I gravitate to one table over the other, and it is, it is a little more height friendly for me. So play with that and see, let us know. Um, okay, I think I missed a couple of comments. Vicki had thoracic outlet syndrome and, de, oh, is that Dequir veins um, here? So Dequir veins, I had that too, that's terrible. So when you take your thumb and you put it in and then you bend, this is an excruciating pain. And so again, that is because our wrists are out of alignment a lot and these muscles are just overtaxed. Um, so we're not gonna get into it today, but uh, I will have a self-care for potters um, video, but um, today we're going to do the yoga poses. So, um, where did I get my stool? Heather, I don't know. I don't remember. It's been a long time. It was, um, from, it was from when I was doing massage all the time. So I would think probably it was a massage catalog or from a local, um, store, but I can look and see if I find a, a, a brand on it. I'll type it in later and let you know. Um, thanks, Jen. Okay, yeah, I look forward to doing the video too. This will be good. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, so we have awareness. So it's all of our different, um, different things that we do as potters, right? So uh, awareness of our body. So I'm naturally a little more on the sway back side. So I have to really pay attention 
to that. Now, the, the health of your back is also having strong abs. So quarantine 15, watch out. So uh, anyway, so we can, if we tilt our bodies, let me see if I can push this back a little bit more. So we have that. Okay, so if we tilt our pelvis forward, look how that moves. See, if the, if the knees are locked here, then it makes our butt stick out, our belly stick out, and then we have this weird torque in our back. But if, and I'm over-exaggerating, of course, just for example, but if we flatten out, tuck the tailbone, do you see how it naturally makes my knees bend a little bit more? The belly goes in, and then we can focus on pushing the shoulder, pulling the shoulders back down and away from the ears. And ideally, the alignment is ear over shoulder over hip. So if the hip is out, that's not an alignment. If the hip is, if the tailbone is tucked and the shoulder is back, see how that's more in alignment? And then you've got your hip and to your ankle. That is proper structural alignment, ear, shoulder, hip, and ankle. Um, Tamara, you're welcome. I'm glad you're finding it amazingly relevant and helpful. Good, that's, that's my mission, is to help other artists to really feel more comfortable in their body, and, and then you don't have to think about it as much, and then you can get more creative and explore more with art and just really dive into that instead of, oh, I hurt here and I have this, and you know, and then it'll accumulate over time. Um, so the other thing we need to be careful about is with um, loading a kiln, of course, um, over the top or front loading. Um, that can make a big difference in, in our backs and how we move. Um, computer work, we, we still have computer work that we have to do even though we wanna be playing with clay all day instead. Um, so again, that's our wrist. So when you're typing, are you, you know, are your wrists bent or are they straight? So you can put, um, again, table height, your chair height, uh, and also they have those little gel pads that you can put or you can tilt your, your laptop. Um, how we sit, you know, if we're comfortable and we're slouched on the sofa and we're reading or watching a movie, that can make a difference. That can create that weird movement where at, in our body, that twist of our spine, whereas if we're sitting up straight and just more aware, that makes a big difference too. Um, and sleeping. Sleeping is a really big thing. We do it for many hours, possibly more hours right now than typical. So um, one thing to keep in mind is when you, are you a side sleeper? Are you a back sleeper? Are you a belly sleeper? All of those do different things to the body when we are, um, when we are relaxed and we're not as conscious, but we can do a couple of props to make us uh, more in alignment while we're sleeping. So if you're a back sleeper and you're flat, if you're completely flat, that can torque the back. But if you roll up, um, you have a pillow or you could roll up a blanket. Um, I just happen to have my yoga mat here. You could put your yoga mat underneath your knees. I don't know if I can demonstrate this. So it would be under your knees. So it would give a little bit of a tilt and it would help the pelvis to be um, in a better alignment while you sleep. If you're a side sleeper, you've probably heard about putting pillows between your knees. And what that does is instead of the knees um, collapsing and the hip being adjust, um, being like off kilter, it'll adjust it, it'll give it a little bit of space and then it'll help to keep that width apart, like the width of your knees. Um, it's hard to explain. I had a visual, but I can't show you right now. So, um, but I think you know what I, I think you know what I mean. Oh, here, here we go. Um, I did, I printed it out. So when you're sleeping, you ideally want to put, um, you want to put something under the knees going across this way so that you're supporting that. And then when you're sleeping, you want to put something again between your knees because see how it tapers down. If you put something between the knees, it'll open it up a little bit more. So that will help. Um, okay. Why don't we dive into some yoga poses because I'm realizing what time it is. Um, did it freeze? It looks like, I think it's still live. 
For some reason, my screen looks like it's frozen, but we're gonna keep going. So let me adjust, bear with me for one moment. I'm going to show you a couple of things here. Noisy, noisy. Okay, so, um, this is the tricky part, but okay. So hopefully, can you see my feet? I think you can. Um, and then I need to have a mirror so that I can ensure we're doing proper alignment there. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to show you was that you can modify some yoga poses. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is against the wall and also in the doorway. So let's start with the doorway first. Hopefully the lighting will be okay. It's all makeshift, so well, all right, we'll see. Um, so standing in the doorway, it does look frozen, but we're gonna keep going. Um, all right, so when we're in, we can use the doorway to open up the chest muscles. So standing, standing in the doorway and finding hip width apart with our feet and standing in the middle, spreading our feet apart. And then oh, see how I rounded the shoulders. I pull the shoulders back. So back and down away from the ears. I'm tucking the tailbone so that my knees have a little bit of a bend with their night hybrid extended. And then I'm opening up into the door. Now there is this stopper here, so I'm going behind it to give myself a little bit more space. If you are um, bigger than me, this may not work. You may need a larger door. I do have a wider door frame, but it, it wasn't, this is a better one for me to do it in. So see how I'm keeping, I'm not high and I'm not low. I'm getting my arms at that right spot. And so, what I'm going to do, my hands are free. My forearms, there's no pressure there. If you do have trouble with your elbows, be careful with this. But what I'm doing is I'm putting my pressure out, straight out. So I'm, I'm pushing in to the wall, into the, I'm sorry, into the door. And so breathing and exhaling, pushing out. And what that's doing is I can feel all of this opening, right? So that's, very good. So proper mechanics there, watching my knees, tilting the pelvis properly, and that's a good way to just open and release this area. Another thing you can do is you can stand in the door. This isn't necessarily yoga, but this is um, a way, see it's even there, and then I can turn and turn and turn, and all this is starting to open. Now you go very slow because this can be very painful to stretch out like that. Um, okay, so of course you wanna do it on both sides of the body and more than one time is ideal. So I'm having trouble seeing comments. I'm gonna to try to refresh my screen there as I show you another one. Um, something else you can do, you're probably familiar if uh, with yoga, the um, warrior poses, and let's see if I can show you this in the doorway. Now, some people are not, um, their balance might keep them from going to a traditional yoga class, the very hand intensive yoga classes. I don't do down dogs, but I figured out a way. I love down dog. That was one of my favorite poses and I absolutely adored it, but it didn't adore my body. And I, and I let it go for a really long time. And that made me really sad because I felt like I wasn't connecting on the level that I really wanted to with my yoga practice. And so I shelved it for a while, honestly. And then I figured out there's so many things that we can do to modify and it doesn't have to look like it does on TV or whatever. I don't even watch TV, I don't know why I said that, but um, you know, we can, we can use our tools and we can adjust as needed. Just like we improvise when we're working with clay and we're using a tool that is a bone or a shell or a plant material, um, 
you know, we can do that with, with the yoga movements as well. So um, here's one with the uh, warrior. You can use the wall and your hip, or if you have a column. And so ideally, you want your knee over your ankle. You do not want to hyperextend. And so see how I'm starting to wedge my back leg? So I am against this so that now... You know, I don't have to worry about, oh, am I, am I wobbly? Do I not feel very stable right now? I am getting down into a pose, and I am, I'm safe. I'm, I'm on the wall. If I need to, I can hold onto the wall, or I can use that just with my legs, and then I can go into my pose, right? And so, again, tucking, knees, things like that is what we're looking for. We can also do, um, so if we're at the wall, we go into warrior two, we can lean against it if we need to. So back foot, right, getting down further, tucking the tail, shoulders back. And I'm, I'm here. I don't, I don't have to, if I'm tired, it's okay. I'm not going to be wobbly and fall over and possibly hurt myself. I've got this, and then I can open my arms, and then I can still do modifications, and I'm safe. I can do triangle, right? So, and then with triangle, a lot of people are like this, then we can use that wall, and we can really open up, open the chest, reach out strong, reach out high, and we can relax into triangle. When you're standing and you're doing triangle, you can't relax into it as much as you might want to. So again, doing both sides of the body. Um, what else did I want to show you? Oh, you could do even a four. I don't think it's centered. Um, you could do a forward bend. You can have your feet wedged on either side. And when we bend, we want to hinge from the hips. We don't want to bend like this. We want to, we want our knees slightly bent. We want to hinge from the hips. And then we can just hang. And we can allow our head, right? Allow our head to hang down and we can relax into that as well. And then other things on the wall, let's see if I've got, is this making sense? I, I hope it's still going. It shows live, but my screen is frozen. I'll have to look for comments in a minute. Okay, so over here against the wall, I think you can see my feet. So what I'm going to do is a version of plank and also a version of down dog. So I'm stepping against the wall. Sorry about that. Okay, I think this will be good. So I'm stepping against the wall. I don't, right now, I don't wanna put my elbow like, under my shoulder because when I move back, it will go at an angle. So I am starting a little lower, and plank is where you're normally on your hands on the ground, and your back is at an angle, you're almost in an L shape. But what we're going to do is use the forearms, and so um, if you're familiar with yoga, often in dolphin pose, you're using your forearms. So your hands are free, your forearms are against the wall, and then I'm stepping back, and then I'm looking for a straight line from my head to my ankles. And again, I want my shoulder and my elbow, and see my hands are free, right? So my shoulder and elbow, and that's plank. Now, if I wanna do down dog, I can move into this position. So this is really pulling and opening this area here. And I can't see myself well, so I don't know if the alignment is as good as I would like it to be, but this will give you an idea of falling into the pose, allowing your head to relax into it. See how I'm just, so I'm in, I'm in plank, step here, back straight, tail tucked, and then I can move into So that gave us the 
down dog version that is hand friendly. Um, I'm having trouble seeing comments. Let's see. Um, I don't know why I can't see your comments. Um, okay. You can see me. You can see my feet. Okay. Oh, wait. I can hear myself. I don't want to hear myself. Sorry. All of a sudden, we're getting a little glitchy at the end. Um, I'm still live. Stomach sleepers. Stomach sleepers, to go back to that, that's a little tricky because your neck is always turned. So on that transverse plane that we were talking about, you're like that for a really long time. I really I find that very tricky. Um, I think you would have to have a really good pillow and maybe prop and adjust yourself well on that one. Um, what about stomachs? Are you still going? You're live. You're live. You could see my feet. Okay. Um, why does that make my upper trap scream? Okay. So Tamara, that's what I was saying. Like easing into things, being very careful, knowing your own body. I've been practicing yoga for 30 years. I might not do it every day, but I can still drop into some deeper poses. And I, um, you know, I'm kind of going a little fast right now with this, but I do plan on doing some videos that are very slow, very um, descriptive and um, focusing on different parts of the body. So that'll be at a later time. Um, when, uh, thank you. You're welcome, Jen. All right. Um, These really show how tight my arms, shoulders, and traps and upper arms are. Exactly. So, um, and again, there'll be some self-massage that you can do. There's a variety of things that we can do to help our bodies along and opening. When we find that pain, that's our body talking to us. And listen to it when it's, um, when it's a tiny whisper before it becomes a scream. Because when it becomes a scream, then it could rip, tear, uh, you know, a variety of, um, of things that we really don't want to, to get into. Um, so if we start paying more attention before it becomes a big issue, then I think you'll notice, um, a little more flexibility and opening in the body. Um, good information. Thank you. You're so welcome. Okay. I hate they only caught the last half, but I'm looking forward to the replay. Hey, Stace. All right. Um, very good. Okay, so I only have a few more minutes left for my time slot, but if anyone has any more questions, let me know. Um, there's so many things that we can do to help our bodies, to help our, our pots. You know, if we align our bodies, it's like when we align the clay and it behaves better and it, it works more efficiently for us and it's more predictable, same thing, right? So, um, and instead of throwing your back out, you want to throw pots. So taking the time to work on your core, I need to do that right now a lot more, but the more that I work on my core, the more that I notice I have muscle memory and it comes back from years ago and it doesn't take as long at, well, sometimes it takes a little longer than I'd like it to, but if I'm consistent, it stays around longer and then my back feels more comfortable and in certain types of body work the the um, cervical the neck and the lumbars the low back though if you notice if people or yourself if you notice that they have neck pain very often they have back pain or vice versa back pain they have a little bit of a twinge in their neck and in a certain type of body work those two parts are connected so from the occiput the base of the head to the sacrum, those are connected, and then cervical vertebrae to lumbars, and then it moves it moves inward. So when something is off, it has to be compensated. I think I have a photo, the domino effect. So when we do, see this is our perfect alignment we were talking about, the ear over the shoulder, over the hips, over the ankles, but when we do a forward movement with the head. See how there's overcompensation? The hips tilt, the shoulders go back in a strange way, and then the neck also um, can get out of alignment. So we don't wanna be this person. We want to be this person. And so that, if you just keep that awareness in your mind, 
Um, I'll be interested to see, like, you know, give me some feedback in a couple of days. Like, oh, did it make a difference that you've been paying more attention? Did you change the way that you slept? Did you adjust driving or computer work? Did you change the height of your table or your chair? Um, did you try the Tai Chi stance with wedging your clay? All these things can add up over time because our bodies didn't get the way they are overnight. Well, sometimes, right? But a lot of times it's a cumulative effect over time and it really can add up and we can we can make a difference. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. I've really enjoyed sharing this with you all. Um, there's so much more that I would like to cover, but um, I wanted to just give you those highlights and um, feel free to reach out and connect with me. Um, my information is... I don't know why I had all these technical issues today, but it's yoga for potters with an S. So um, I just started a Facebook page and I also just started an Instagram and I do have a website, yogaforpotters.com. And so look, that's me doing tree in the trees. So I hope you found this helpful. Um, let's see if there's any other questions that I can answer. All right, let me scroll back just a smidge. All right. Any tips for hips that get stiff sitting? Oh, thank you. I am so glad you brought that up. Um, who was that? That was Sherry. So um, the psoas muscle, and I'm going to be conscious of time, but the psoas muscle goes from this area down. And so when we're sitting, right, driving at the wheel, this is very compressed. And so one of the things, sorry for the noise, um, one of the things I wanted to show you with, I'm so glad you asked this question, it's such a major, major thing. Um, so here's my, whoop, gonna go down and I'm going to get that. Now what you can do when you're at the chair is to open the psoas, you can sit carefully, center or to the edge, and you can bring that leg back. So we're opening this part of the body. And then over time, you can, now you don't want your back to be all squirrely. You want it, you want your hips properly tilted and then play with this, right? You need to be careful of the knee. You don't want it all wonky, but you want to be moving back like that. There is a pose that you can do in yoga that's very, it's like a lunge. And so basically you're doing the lunge. Now I want this front knee to be at 90 degrees, ideally, which I'm close, but I need to go down a little. And then taking that back. So I'm pushing it, pushing it back, body straight. And then you can really feel that. Now I'm on this moving chair, so I can actually move a little bit more into, into my stretch and open the psoas that way. So that's very helpful. Um, what else is there with the psoas? There's so many, there's so many different things. Um, but you wanna do that carefully. Another one you could do seated at the chair is before you did the psoas stretch perhaps, is to do gate pose, which is opening the leg. Now I feel, ooh, I feel a pinch right there. So opening the leg to the side, that leg doesn't wanna do it. Um, okay, opening the leg to the side, and then you can stretch up and over with that. So gate, G-A-T-E, so that's a possible pose. You can also, if we're going on the um, transverse plane of of um, movement, the anatomical movement, the twisting. So we can bring our hand back and open and twist, right? On our breath, following through. What I like to do, instead of using this hand and gripping, I like to turn it and use that pressure. And then I seem to get a little bit more, right? I'm putting that shoulder back and I'm moving. And then my head is looking over that shoulder. So I don't have to grip with this and I don't have to grip here. I can just use that and open that way. Um, what else? One that I wanted to show you. Um, oh, you can also do um, cat cow, which is usually on your hands and knees, but you can open the body and then round it 
open, rounded, open. So following your breath, of course you would go a lot slower than that. I'm just at the end, so I'm going a little faster. Um, we also did all the wall support and the doorway support and mountain pose is the one where you're standing and you're in proper alignment with ears over shoulders, over hips, over ankles. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. Okay. Tight hips. Yes. Um, any knee tips at the wheel? Um, Heather, explain that a little bit more. Do you mean like how to keep your knees at 90 degrees? That's where you want to put, instead of tiptoes or too low, you want to put a block so that you do have that. And of course, the adjustable chair as well. Um, oh, look at all these thank yous. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Thanks for being here. All right. Please remind viewers not to stretch on cold muscles. Yes, Cami, that's what we talked about in the beginning was warming up. And so, um, again, this is just um, a quick overview. This in no way is a, a flow or um, an isolated thing. Uh, ideally, we would build and stretch, but I just want to show you and bring some awareness to the possibilities that you can still have a yoga practice. It's not about doing down dogs on your hands, so. All right, we are just over time, so I'm going to sign off now. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. And again, reach out to me, find me, um, Yoga for Potters, and I look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you so much. Take care. Happy potting, and keep those arms and hands safe, and wash those hands. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Bye.